how can we use spatial finance to reach sustainable development goals? Well, first of all, let's find out what spatial finance is. It's where geospatial data is integrated into financial theory and practice, and it creates numerous opportunities for financial industry players. To help us learn more about these opportunities and the practical application of geospatial data, we have with us Christophe Christian, Sustainable Finance Lead at Satellite Applications Catapult, and Dr. Matthew McCartan, Spatial Finance Lead at the University of Oxford Sustainable Finance Program. Thank you both for joining. Thank you, Kisa. It's our pleasure to, to be here and talk about one of our favorite topics. Great. So let's start with the basics. Since it's your favorite topic, I'd love for you to <laughs> expound on and, and put it a little more eloquently than I did, please. What is spatial finance and how is this geospatial data collected? Sure. So as you said, um, spatial finance is the integration of geospatial data and analysis into financial theory and practice. Uh, and this is relevant because it will or it can profoundly change how risks, opportunities, and impacts are measured and managed by financial institutions. It allows for truly bottom-up assessments of risks, opportunities, and impacts, uh, of bottom-up monitoring and, and tracking of assets, and really seeing what's happening on the ground in near real time. And you can do this um, analysis really ranging from the kind of the, the micro level, like on an individual site or location, to aggregating uh, on, on a macro level. So there's, there's, there's quite a a range of, of analysis you can do on the back of this data. Now, what is geospatial data? Um, it is, it's typically any type of information really that is linked to a specific location. So it's either collected from um, positioning or location data from your phone, for instance, it can be um, aerial photography or data collected from drones or UAVs. But the type of geospatial data that we are most interested in as part of the kind of spatial finance vision, if you like, is uh, satellite Earth observation data. So this is really data that's being collected by satellites um, who orbit um, around the, the Earth constantly, taking images uh, and measurements of the Earth's surface and atmosphere um, multiple times a day often, uh, and, and send this back down to Earth. So it's really this type of uh, Earth observation data, remote sensing data that we are most interested in uh, as part of a whole range of spatial finance applications. And the reason we're most interested in, in this type of data, or satellite data, is that it has some inherent qualities uh, which make it quite a valuable source of information uh, to analyze a whole range of sustainability-related risks, opportunities, and impacts. Uh, and it's a, a data source that is super or very complementary to some of the existing uh, sources of data and information that are used in finance, such as financial news or, or corporate disclosures. Um, for instance, satellite data is, 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 is uh, as a source of information, it's, it's much more neutral and objective. Um, it's being collected by um, instruments that are hundreds of kilometers uh, away from us. It provides an observation uh, rather than a disclosure or something that is self-reported by corporates. Um, in terms of coverage, the data is collected globally uh, and can be collected really on any point uh, on Earth. Uh, whereas again, for example, corporate disclosure is on a lot of ESG and sustainability related topics, it's not mandatory, uh, so it can be very patchy in terms of coverage. Um, the data coming from satellites is inherently comparable if you collect it with the same sensor or the same satellite. Whereas again, disclosures because of a lack of standards, uh, particularly on the on the sustainability side of things and the ESG side of things, uh, can be rather hard to to compare one against another. And finally, satellite data, geospatial data, can be made and much can be made available much more frequently or is collected much more uh, frequently compared to um, the kind of annual reporting cycles that we see from from corporate disclosures again so it can really add to the um, the timeliness and the action the actionability uh, of data for um, sustainable development and equally sustainable financial decision making so this sounds great i'm hearing that the Earth observation data helps firms with sustainability. Risk is collected more frequently and it's more actionable. What about the costs? How easy is it to really get into this form of, of data collection? What costs are there? Are there any barriers to entry? So in terms of um, barriers and, uh, and, and costs and access to data, it's really come down a lot in the last couple of years and particularly in the last uh, decades. 
Um, we've seen an unpre unprecedented level of investment and innovation in the space sector, uh, driven by um, satellite hardware miniaturization on the one hand, uh, standardization of platforms uh, on the other hand, and also the re reduced launch costs. Um, you may have seen um, the, the launches of SpaceX and, and Elon Musk's investment in the sector, uh, which meant that because launch vehicles are able to be reused uh, and become much cheaper, um, the, the cost of launching a satellite into orbit, for instance, has come down like um, a factor 10, a factor 100 uh, in some cases as well. It's become much more flexible to, to, to launch and, and operate these satellites as well. Um, so we've really seen um, a whole bunch of startups and entrepreneurs leveraging these trends to launch more satellites uh, and in doing so, collecting huge volumes of data from anywhere on the planet. And because they're using smaller platforms uh, in a much more agile and, and low-cost way, uh, the, the cost of uh, the data coming down is, is, is reducing quite a bit as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, we've seen huge amounts of public investment actually going into uh, open source satellite data capabilities. So again, making huge volumes of, of high quality Earth observation data available for free every day. Uh, in the US, there's the Landsat program um, that has made a whole lot of Earth observation data publicly available. In, the, in Europe, we have the Copernicus program, which are basically sending down to Earth terabytes of high quality data um, that's available for free for anyone in, in, in the world um, every day. So we really seen that the amount of, of data uh, has exploded. Um, the accessibility is increasing a lot. Uh, the cost is coming down a lot. Uh, and in parallel, advancements in, in, in AI, in data processing and machine learning also mean that these huge quantities of data are actually um, much more easy or to be processed and they can actually be used and leveraged in a much more effective way. Open source data and high quality open source data, that's always a plus. So great to know that. Wondering if you could take us through an actual use case. So a company or a firm who's looking to use this data, how does it happen? What does this solve for? And then what are the end benefits that we wouldn't see if we did not have access to this data? Uh, I guess there are a number of current applications for this type of data. Um, so these kind of range from the likes of commodity trading. Um, so it's possible to sort of look at things like oil storage levels to understand sort of the flow of oil um, across the globe. So you can start to make more informed decisions um, about sort of oil futures. Um, you can do similar type of analysis around kind of agricultural uh, commodity trading. So you can start to look at sort of agricultural yields to understand sort of um, what those commodities are likely to be doing in the future. Um, you can also, within kind of the insurance industry, they've been using spatial data for quite a number of years. Um, so they've been looking at things like uh, ex post damage assessments. So you can start to look at uh, damages across a wide area after extreme events. So you can start to actually do some damage assessments at a wider area than might be possible um, just sort of looking at it at a local le uh, level. Um, and the kind of final main current application for spatial finance at the moment is around sort of assessing broader macroeconomic trends. Um, so there's a number of different ways that this can be done. So we can start to look at things like uh, night lights to understand sort of broader macroeconomic trends. We can use that as kind of a proxy for economic activity. Uh, we can also sort of monitor things around um, the number of ships going into and out of a port or the amount of traffic that is sort of entering and e exiting uh, shopping malls. So you can start to use all of that information to sort of inform uh, un our understanding of broader macroeconomic trends. So that's just, uh, I guess, the current applications for spatial finance. Um, but there are a lot of potential applications that we are sort of delving into a lot within the Spatial Finance Initiative. So a, a lot of our interest is particularly around sort of understanding environmental and sustainability related issues, uh, which is a, a particularly useful uh, use case for spatial data uh, due to the inherent spatial nat nature of those kind of risks and impacts. So we can start to look at things like uh, climate change risks. So we can look at transition risks. So one of the key kind of transition risks around uh, kind of emissions. Um, so we can use sort of satellite imagery to directly observe facilities, understand their characteristics and estimate their emissions. 
or alternatively, we can actually start to directly measure emissions from those facilities using some of the various sensors that are available on the satellites. So we can actually start to trace those emissions back to an individual point source and start to sort of attribute those emissions to particular companies and particular investors. Um, you can use this for a similar type of process for um, kind of assessing physical climate risks. So we can start to look at things like flooding, sea level rise, heat stress, water stress, and other kind of extreme weather events like hurricanes or cyclones. So once we actually start to identify assets and kind of map those onto the globe, we can then sort of overlay those types of risk maps to understand kind of the risk exposure. And then we can mm-hmm. kind of aggregate those risks up to a corporate level to actually understand the broader risk exposure for various companies. Mm-hmm. Um, we can do similar type of analysis for kind of more environmentally focused issues. So we can look at things like biodiversity and mm-hmm. kind of the environmental impacts that facilities might be having. So we can look at mm-hmm. um, where facilities are located, what's actually happening to the surrounding environment. Um, and then we can start to sort of actually attribute um, some kind of causality to environmental changes that might be occurring. Wow. The interesting thing, it sounds like this is adopted from both a government level as well as a business level, right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, great. So if I'm, if, if we're looking at, you know, really pitching this idea, if you will, what would be the, what would be the examples that would tend to stand out as really great examples from a government perspective, as well as from a business perspective? So who's used this satellite data well, who's done a great job of it and who should really be cast as a use case if I'm looking at pitching this as a possible as a possible way to to get data, the Earth observation data? I would say on the Earth observation data, traditionally it's the the kind of land uh, resource uh, sectors that have made most and most efficient use of it because of the pure operational benefits it's it has had. Uh, so we've seen it used and leveraged a lot in, in agriculture to improve yields, um, to um, do um, precision farming, um, identify uh, pests or, or drought issues before they can infect the crops. Uh, and we've seen that being taken up in both the kind of individual farm level, but equally uh, in policy making and from, um, from, from the buyer's perspective to understand um, supply chain uh, risks or potential um, stresses uh, for 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 the growing and selling season uh, and then even further upwards with kind of the commodity trading side of things or even um, banks or insurers that have used this type of data to understand credit risk associated with um, the kind of yeah underlying performing assets of, of some of the farms and the farmers and the the businesses that they're, that they're lending to so they've really made made proper use of of the data here throughout the entire value chain and uh, with an increasing interest also from policymakers and regulators to look at the kind of sustainability or for example biodiversity impacts of land use practices there's a huge potential there as well to leverage the same data source um, to uh, or the same underlying data sets to to really feed throughout the entire chain information on how for example, from a bottom-up farmer perspective, uh, they are adhering to specific practices, specific um, regenerative uh, agriculture techniques or carbon uh, capture techniques in soil, etc., or um, leaving uh, a certain number of forests um, planted rather than tracking it down. So this is really, I think, on the, the, the land use sectors and their entire value chains, uh, mm. there's, there's a huge potential there. And how broadly is this being adopted? If you had to give a percentage from a government perspective as well as from a business perspective, how broadly has this been adopted so far? So I think the technologies have been adopted differently across different sectors. They've typically been uh, or more widely adopted, let's say, in the kind of uh, Western uh, or global North uh, countries compared to the some of the the more emerging mm. markets. Um, so I'd say all the kind of mm-hmm. yeah, it's 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 regional and it's sectoral. So very much kind of yeah, regional who has traditionally had the kind of skills and capabilities to afford this type of data when it was much more expensive uh, and and harder to to process. Um, so that's kind of the the regional side of things, and then sectoral. It's traditionally again been those sectors that have had a lot of operational benefit, such as agriculture, but equally mining uh, and fisheries. We've seen some good adoption as well. Um, 
and kind of planning and, and kind of land use management from a policy perspective. But with, with a lot of these barriers coming down, particularly in terms of cost and also ease of access, there's a huge potential also for emerging markets, uh, policymakers, or even investors uh, in sovereign debt, uh, et cetera, from emerging markets to use um, some of the data and, and, and these techniques to uh, either inform policy, uh, inform uh, nature climate related financial risks associated with with key sectors or uh, or assets uh, and act upon it i think one example actually that we've seen uh of, of some of this approach in action i think was a couple of weeks ago where there were sovereign debt investors who uh based on deforestation data um from a brazilian uh, I don't remember the name of the Brazilian agency that tracks deforestation in the Amazon, but it's basically based on satellite data, they track deforestation. And because of the rates were so alarmingly high, sovereign debt investors engaged with the Brazilian governments to put a moratorium on um, on, on further um, forest fires for, I think, a couple of months or something like that. But again, it's it's the underlying power of, of, of much more frequently and near-time available data that helps drive... Um, these actions and decisions uh, across the, the the value chain, if you like, um, from a, a lot of these sectors. So, yeah, it's 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 new ones, but it's 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 rapidly increasing across all sectors. Mm. So if we so in wrapping this up, this is great information, um, Dr. McCartan and Christophe. Are there is there a direction that you see this moving in in 2021 that you believe investors should be prepared for, in terms of really really leveraging this new opportunity around around satellite i think this um probably where the transparency element comes into play and i'll, I'll give my thoughts and then matt do, do chip in um i think a lot of of on the at least on the, on the finance side and the sustainability side they've talked a lot about um TCFD and climate risk, and now they're talking about nature-related financial risks uh, and the need for more and better disclosures uh, of how companies um, uh, or governments are exposed to specific type of risk. And the, the key strength of the type of data that we are talking about is that it doesn't rely on disclosures. It's in a way available for uh, anyone is becoming increasingly available in terms of cost and, 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 and ease of processing that allow you to collect and capture data without having to wait for corporates or, or whomever you're investing in to disclose uh, what risks or impacts they're, they're exposed to. So it is really an amazing tool that allows for a much more proactive um, ass assessment and management of a whole range of, of risks that we know we need to address. Um, uh, across yeah the whole chain of, of government finance uh, and industry so that's for me the kind of the key opportunity and the key thing that i will that we are starting to see happen uh, and and that we'll see even more uh, over the year to come great information from helping firms with sustainability to really getting a better understanding of a firm's assets to um, giving us all insight that we didn't have just a few years ago, deeper insight. And it looks like there's going to be a lot more in the area of spatial finance. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew McCartan and Christoph Christian. We invite you to subscribe to the Refinitive Sustainability Perspectives podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you stream your content. What did you think about the podcast? Leave us a review on iTunes or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter for updates on our show. You can even check us out on YouTube now. Thank you for joining. See you next time.